want, yeah. Put, put, put all your stuff down so you don't do Good morning. I'm Congresswoman Jackie Spear, and I'm joined today by many people who are representing the voices of hundreds of thousands of survivors who have been victimized by military sexual trauma and who have been treated uh, abysmally. We are here today to right an egregious wrong in our military justice system. The fact that one person, one person can overturn a punishment determined by a judge or a jury flies in the face of justice. We need a military justice system for the 21st century. The one we have now is primitive and is reminiscent of a time when punishments were decided by an autocrat, not by a judge or jury. The epidemic of rape and sexual assault is directly related to this broken system that has, it hasn't evolved to meet the standards of justice in the 21st century. On November 2nd, Lieutenant Colonel James Wilkerson was found guilty of aggravated sexual assault for entering the room of a house guest and sexually assaulting her while she slept. Wilkerson was court-martialed at the command of Lieutenant General Craig Franklin, a three-star general, on the charges of aggravated sexual assault, abusive sexual contact, and three counts of conduct unbecoming an officer and gentleman. Franklin handpicked the five jurors who returned the guilty verdict, the lieutenant colonel and four colonels. The jury sentenced Wilkerson to one year in prison and a dishonorable discharge. On February 26th, three-star General Franklin rejected the very jury he had handpicked and overturned the punishment. He set Wilkerson free and reinstated the pilot to active duty with a clean slate. It's like nothing ever happened. Currently, our hands are shackled to do anything about it. The Uniform Code of Military Justice, known as the UCMJ, is written so that even the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States can't change General Franklin's decision. Not even the President of the United States. This is not justice. This is a mockery of justice. And we need to fix it. What has happened in this case is especially tragic because up until the astonishing conclusion, the case followed the ideal and rare path. The victim bravely came forward to report the crime, something that less than 13% of victims actually do. Franklin, the commanding officer, referred the case to court martial, which only happens in 20% of reported cases. And the prosecution won a conviction which occurs in only 7% of the cases. You can see the statistics right here. We're talking about this very small circle. Wilkerson was convicted, and then the convening authority, this is the three-star general, the three-star general made this go away. General Franklin's legal advisor, a JAG, who is assigned to him, told him not to reverse the decision. But he did so anyway. And no one knows why. Was it because Wilkerson, an F-16 pilot, was called a, quote, Air Force superstar? We won't know, because you know what? Under the UCMJ, this convene authority can change a decision made by a judge or jury and give no reason whatsoever. No trail, no rationale, 
just an autocratic decision to do what he wants to do. Put quite simply, the military justice system is rigged in favor of the assailant. Victims do not believe that perpetrators will be punished, so they don't report. That's why only 13% report. They fear humiliation, or worse, being labeled with a personality disorder and involuntarily, but honorably, discharged from the military. Reporting a rape is a career ender. The power of one person not elected to overturn convictions and reduce or dismiss sentences is a relic. It goes back to 1775, a time when a soldier would have to forfeit one-sixth of a dollar for skipping church, and when you're fined four shillings for every curse word you uttered. We're not in 1775. We're in 2013. And the UCMJ needs to reflect the value system, the criminal justice system that we embrace in the 21st century. It's time to get rid of this system the way our allies have. New Zealand, Canada, Israel, the UK. Today, Congressman Bruce Bailey and I are introducing the Military Justice Reform Act to strip the convening authority of the power to dismiss convictions or reduce punishments that should be left to the appellate process. Our bill amends Article 60 and Article 63 and takes away the power of the convening authority to dismiss, commute, lessen, or order a rehearing after a panel or judge has found the accused guilty and rendered a punishment. Due to the robust nature of the appellate process, this authority is not necessary. Every conviction in a court martial is still eligible for the appellate process. And that's what is lost in a situation where the convening authority can just arbitrarily decide to ignore the decision by the judge or jury in a court martial. For all intents and purposes, it encourages a miscarriage of justice. Air Force leaders have described sexual misconduct as a cancer in the ranks that the service is struggling to combat. But they have done nothing to take the power away from a single person who decides if a punishment is actually upheld. This is not how to deal with a cancer, and this is not zero tolerance. Tomorrow, our colleagues in the Senate Armed Services Committee will hold a hearing about the epidemic of rape and sexual assault in the military. They will hear testimony from survivors of military sexual trauma and then have the opportunity to question military leadership about what they are doing to address this problem. It's a hearing that's taken place over and over again in the halls of Congress. It's time for us to do more than have hearings. We will be watching and hoping to get answers to the following questions. How many sentences have been reduced by the so-called convening authority? How many cases never see the light of day, never go to a court-martial because this commander, this convening authority, prevents a court-martial from ever taking place? Has the military looked at other countries like the UK that have taken the authority away from commanders and set up a separate impartial office to handle these cases. On Thursday, the Air Force's leading legal authority, Judge Advocate General, Lieutenant General Richard Harding, said of the military justice system, quote, the 238 year track record that has produced wonderful results for our country should be considered before the law is changed. For the Judd Advocate General to call this a wonderful military justice system is part of the problem. This is a military justice system that does not work for victims. It's a military justice system that works for assailants. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, an outstanding um, spokesperson on this issue um, who gets it, 
Uh, Congressman Bruce Braley. Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> well, thank you for your incredible leadership on this important issue, and I'm just very honored to be a co-sponsor of this legislation with you. This is the Washington Post article that ran on March 8th when this story first broke. And I want to read you a sentence uh, talking about this travesty. The decision to grant him clemency has infuriated many female lawmakers and advocacy groups who said the outcome will discourage victims from reporting abuse. This is one male law lawmaker who is outraged and continues to be outraged by the disconnect between the Pentagon's stated commitment to eliminating sexual assault in the military and outcomes like this that turn justice on its head and seem to provide due process only to the accused and their supervising officers. And that is why this bill is absolutely critical. Because due process is supposed to lead to consistent results for consistent crimes with consistent penalties. And what you have basically in this situation is a pardon that was granted after the jury trial before the appeals process ever took place. And unlike a pardon in civilian life, where the governor or president who makes that choice to ignore an outcome that has been determined by the courts and is then held accountable by the voters for the actions they take, these decisions are being made by a superior officer who has no accountability under the, the Uniform Code of Military Justice to the outcomes that they mandate. That is why the law needs to change because we have ignored this problem for far too long and it makes a mockery of the Pentagon's so-called zero tolerance policy on sexual assault in the military when outcomes like this are allowed to take place. And that is why I am lending my voice and I am proud to join my colleagues in the House and Senate. One of the other things that infuriates me, Congresswoman, is you and I and the senators who are going to be involved in this hearing tomorrow were just out at the Pentagon getting a briefing from their experts on reducing and eliminating sexual assault in the military about all the extraordinary progress the Pentagon has made on this issue. And I'm talking about progress from a time when they used to use materials that actually said, ask her when she's sober as a way of protecting women and men from military sexual assault. So this is completely inconsistent with what we were told was going to be happening as part of a strong commitment at the highest levels of the Pentagon. Congresswoman Speer and I have sat down with one-on-one -on -one meetings with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, with former Secretary of Defense Panetta, and with the Army Chief of Staff, and we have passionately advocated for improvements in this system and have been assured at every step of the way that we are making the right steps to send the right messages up and down the chain of command that this is a problem that we believe needs to be addressed. This outcome, if it is allowed to stand, sends the exact opposite message of what the Pentagon's commitment truly is to eliminating military sexual assault, and that's why I am proud to be a part of this. Next, uh, Nancy Parrish, who is the president of Protect Our Defenders, a program providing services to victims of sexual assault and rape in the military. Hello, everyone. Protect Our Defenders is a place for survivors to build a community, a movement, to collectively amplify their voices, support one another, and take action for fundamental change. Regardless of all of the recently announced reforms, we regularly hear from active duty service members who are raped or assaulted and are being denied opportunities to report, are being retaliated against, diagnosed with errant medical dis dis diagnoses, and being charged with collateral misconduct after reporting the incident. We hear from commanders and prosecutors trying to do the right thing, but are being thwarted by higher-ups. 
The only thing exceptional about this particular injustice of General Franklin is that it has become public. It has put a spotlight on how broken the biased and conflicted military justice system really is. Recently, Wilkerson's victim reached out for support and asked us to communicate on her behalf. Her full statement will be provided to the Senate Armed Services Committee at the hearing tomorrow. A portion of her statement reads as follows. Quote, during this entire ordeal, I kept to myself. I endured eight months of public humiliation, investigations, and suffered through an Article 32 hearing where I was interrogated for several hours by Wilkerson's legal counsel without benefit of having my own legal counsel because it's not permitted. The defense did everything they could to drag my name and character through the mud. I still went to work and I did my job. My superiors, investigators, and the prosecution team were professional and worked very hard. They pursued the case in the face of unrelenting personal and professional attacks. I can see why many in their position would not want to risk their careers by standing up for a victim. When the trial was over, I was relieved. I felt that I could hold my head up, that I had done the right thing. The actions taken by General Franklin are shocking and disappointing. Why put the investigators, the prosecutors, the judge and jury, and me through this if one person can set aside justice with a swipe of a pen? I am 49 years old. I'm pretty together. But if it was this hard on me, what's in store for a young airman? I did the right thing. I was sexually assaulted, and I reported it. And now General Franklin has made sure that his decision cannot be changed. What really scares me is the perpetrator will remain in a position of military leadership. Really? Leadership? End quote. The culture of victim blaming while failing to punish the perpetrator must end. Before making his decision, General Franklin did not speak with the victim or has since made any effort to see how she is doing. General Franklin owes her an apology. His decision was contrary to the recommendations of his legal advisor. His refusal to explain his actions sends a strong message. The victim is a liar, the judge was wrong, the prosecutor is unethical, and the jury incompetent. Sadly, General Breedlove, commander of the U.S. Air Forces in Europe and Franklin's superior officer, disappointingly reinforced that message by supporting General Franklin's decision. According to press accounts, he said, I've been there. I've been in his shoes. I have faith in this commander that he put a lot of work into this decision. On the other hand, Air Force, General, Air Force Chief of Staff General Welsh recently said, everybody in our Air Force, every commander, every supervisor who isn't actively engaged in being part of this solution is part of the problem. General Franklin, you're part of the problem. Now is the time for General Welsh and Secretary Hagel to do the right thing. Senior officers must be held accountable for failing to take rape and assault within the military seriously. General Franklin's decision undermined good order and discipline. This, is, this was a biased command decision, and it's too much power for one individual to have. Protect Our Defenders strongly supports Congresswoman Spears' bill to strip military commanders of this power. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kirby Dick, the director of the award-winning and Academy-acclaimed movie documentary called The Invisible War. And I might add, and I've told this to Kirby privately, in our meetings with the Vice Chiefs of Staff recently, um, they made a point of saying that the movie is so instructive that they're now starting to use it as part of their training uh, for military personnel. So a, a, great, a great effort on his part uh, for creating that kind of conscience uh, within the military. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, I think we're, we're very fortunate that uh, this uh, decision by General Franklin was made public. Um, I think it showed the entire country what victims of sexual assault are experiencing every day, a system that is set up to fail to give them justice. As civilians, we are shocked by this obvious abuse of authority. 
but I'm afraid the Pentagon isn't at all shocked that General Franklin has the power to commit this abuse. The only thing shocking to them is the timing, that this decision was made so close to the first Senate hearing on this issue in more than a decade. Our military has an embedded serial predator problem and has had this problem for many decades. Until we are able to effectively investigate, prosecute, and incarcerate these predators, this will continue. But in order to do this, victims first have to report, and this is where the system fails very badly. We know that more than 85% of victims of sexual assault do not report, which means that these predators are able to assault again and again. As long as victims have to report into their chain of command, there will be a chilling effect. Victims are reluctant to report into the chain of command because they realize they won't get impartial justice. The convening authority is in a conflict of interest position. Also, being sexual, sexually assaulted is a profoundly personal and traumatic experience, and very few people would want to report their victimhood into their workplace. When I was making The Invisible War, I was astonished by the Pentagon's lack of urgency about sexual assault and its profound lack of understanding ab about the experience that victims go through. I've been back to the Pentagon several times since the film has been released. The good news is there is now a real sense of urgency. The bad news is that the, they still don't seem to yet understand the victim's perspective, particularly when it comes to reporting. They seem to think that if they, train their, they can train their way out of this problem, that they only have to educate commanders to do the right thing and this problem will be solved. But that is nowhere near enough. The problem is structural and will continue as long as victims have to report into their chain of command. The military claims that commanders need this absolute authority without any oversight because to take it away would weaken com their command. But they are wrong. Oversight strengthens authority. Without oversight, there is abuse, and nothing weakens an institution more than the abuse of power. We will know the military is truly serious about stopping sexual assault when it removes the adjudication of these crimes from the convening authority and place it in, places it in the hands of professionally trained prosecutors and judges. Until it does, they will continue to have a very serious problem. And I, I just want to add, I hope that I do, 10 years from now, I don't have to come back and we, see, we still see this problem and then you know, we will be in a position where we will feel compelled to make a sequel to this. So finally, I'd just like to say that I very much support this bill put forward by uh, Representative Speer and Representative Braley. And uh, it's extremely important that this move forward through the Congress as quickly as possible. Thank you. And finally, Susan Burke, a Washington, D.C. attorney who has really put a spotlight on these issues by filing a number of lawsuits uh, against the secretaries of defense and this, the department uh, because of the lack of due process and equal protection under the laws for victims. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to have an opportunity to speak today. I applaud Congressman Spears and Congressman Braley for their leadership on this issue. This is our nation, and this is our military. The brave men and women that go far beyond what the rest of us do and are willing to put their lives on the line, that level of patriotism, and we reward them with a second-class form of justice, it is a national disgrace, and it needs to end now. Not next year, not a decade, not after seven more sex scandals. We need Congress to exercise its constitutional power and treat these people like Americans that they are. So I urge all of you that have heard about this issue or that uh, are watching the broadcast in any way, pick up the phone, pick up your mobile phone and text, but let Congress raise your voice. Don't just buy a soldier a beer at a bar. Do something more important. Make sure that he and she have the same justice that you have. So we need everyone to act, and we need you to act today. Thank you. Questions? Oh. I've got, we've just gotten notice of our, our first um, Co-sponsor on the Republican side, Patrick Meehan, is joining forces with us in supporting this bill. This is a huge breakthrough for Congress. He couldn't be here today because he um, had work in the district, but um, 
I think also that's also a former prosecutor and a former U.S. attorney. Tyler Campbell with KQED in Washington. Have you talked to the Air Force about your bill and, and gotten any sort of feedback as to whether or not they are open to some sort of change uh, that you are proposing there at all? I haven't talked specifically about this newest proposal. I have spoken with them ad nauseum about the efforts we have made to try and take the uh, the focus away from the chain of command and place it in a separate authority within the military so that these cases can be independently evaluated and where a conflict of interest won't be placing such undue influence in the decision making. And the Air Force had representatives at the meeting at the Pentagon. The Air Force had representatives at the meeting at the Pentagon that we attended along with Senator McCaskill, Senator Shaheen, and others who are passionate about this issue. And they were on the record at that meeting as being just as committed to every, as everyone else to eliminating this problem. And that's why this is so disappointing to us. And, and let me underscore the fact that so much of this is happening in the Air Force. It shouldn't be lost on any of us that Lackland Air Force Base, where 62 victims were sexually assaulted or raped, and 32 military training instructors were implicated. And not one of those victims, not one, ever reported it. It was a, another military training instructor, three of them actually, independently of each other, that reported it. So this system is more than broken. What are you going to get out of tomorrow's hearing? Well, tomorrow's hearing will be an opportunity for the Senate to take action and, and evaluate the issues. Um, this bill has to move forward. And I think Susan Burke put it extremely well when she said, why should members of the military be second-class citizens in this country and not have the same due process and judicial system that exists in the civilian world? Yes. Well, that's one of the questions we would like to have answered. Um, we've been told that it's happened at least five times. Uh, we know it happened at Vandenberg Air Force Base, again, in the Air Force. It's unclear um, how widespread it is through all of the services, um, but it's, it's pretty clear that it's, it's not uncommon um, in the Air Force. But let's be real clear. It's already uncommon. The fact that so few cases ever get to court-martial and fewer yet end in conviction I mean, we're talking about a handful of cases, and even if there's once or twice that the convening authority overturns it, it's a significant number. Um, do you, uh, what do you think of uh, Secretary Hagel saying that he, he will uh, review the Wilkerson case? Do you think that's a good indication that they may be open to these changes? The review of the Wilkerson case is not going to change anything. And I think we, I, I'm, I'm delighted that Secretary Hagel is going to, to weigh in on this issue. But let's be real clear. The authority that exists in the UCMJ trumps the president from taking any action. And as Congressman Braley said, General Franklin is not accountable to anyone. And in our structure, of a justice system, when you use a pardon or a commutation, it's by someone who is elected, be it governor or president, and those people are held accountable. Do I? Okay. No, I just think that in addition to the president not having that authority, the commander in chief of our entire armed services does not have that authority. <laughs> And that flies in the face of everything I've ever learned about due process under the law and an appeals process that has an ultimate person deciding what is justice. So even if they were going to remove it from the normal appeals process under the UMCJ, you would think that the commanding officer of the commanding officers would have the authority to review this decision to protect the rights of all parties. And even that is not permissible under the UMCJ that exists today. Any
Thank you all. Thank you.